Hello, everyone. Welcome to Miami Beach Urban Studios Live Art Talk with Charo Cat. I'm Colette Mello, and I'll be moderating today's conversation with Charo. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our friends at the Miami Beach Department of Tourism and Office of Cultural Affairs for sponsoring these art talks. Charo Kett is a Florida International University alumna and a Miami-based visual artist that works in performance, fiber, painting, and installation. Her thoughtful work has underpinnings of Afro-Caribbean rituals and traditions, cultural identity, and decolonization. She is a founder of Edge Zone and has curated multiple performance festivals. Her work has been exhibited internationally and her work is part of the permanent collections of the Frost Art Museum, the Bass Museum, the Museum in Fort Lauderdale, and the New Zealand National Museum. So Charles, thank you for joining us. I'm so happy you agreed to be part of our art talks. Great to see you. We appreciate and I feel very honored to be invited for this talk. Um, I am an alumni and, you know, love FIU and all the teachers and, a lot, you know, many of the people that I went to school with. So it's a pleasure um, to share my work and my, you know, my life uh, through these images. Um, so, you know, <laughs> I hope you're going to enjoy it. Thank you. Everyone, just um, a note, if you have any questions or comments, put them through the Zoom chat, or if you're on Facebook, you can put them through the chat, or if you're on Instagram, you can put them in the chat and they'll get to me. So, sorry about that. Charo, go ahead. So, um, I'm going to start with the fact that um, I was born in Dominican Republic, and I was uh, born to a family that uh, is, my mother is Afro-Dominican, Black Dominican, and my father, White Dominican. Sorry, Charo, did you share your screen? We don't see it yet. We did, hold on. Uh, I thought I did. Let's see. Share screen. Ah, uh, here we go. Now you can see it? Yes. Yes. Okay, now? Yes? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right, so my mother is a Black Dominican, my father, uh, a White Dominican, we, my father was a high ranking military officer during the, the Trujillo uh, dictatorship. Um, and we had to exile in 1962 to the US and um, lived in Bayonne, New Jersey for about six years until things got a little better. This is my grandfather, who was a Puerto Rican, uh, a, a black Puerto Rican from the, uh, that came to the Dominican Republic with the occupation of the American occupation in 1916. Uh, my, my mother was also, my mother and her family were very aware of color, of being black Dominicans. A lot of Dominicans are not. My, my family, I think it had to do because my grandfather was a black man coming from the US, which was, uh, you know, Puerto Rico. Um, he was very aware of it and how important education was for black people. He felt the only way a black man rises is through education. So all my mother's family, all her sisters are mostly doctors with one and two degrees. My mother was not because she had dyslexia. So when she came to America, she had to basically learn how to be, she had never, she had never had done any housework whatsoever and had to actually learn to not only cook and everything for her family, but also become a housekeeper for my, my aunt's friends, uh, doctors there, because I had an aunt who was a doctor there. So, you know, there was a lot of shifting from being sort of upper class to being um, working class. And uh, then going back to the Dominican Republic in 69, when I was 16, going to a prep school there where everybody there was uh, sort of the oligarchy, the you know, children of, of either the American embassy or the Dominican sort of presidents and people who were going to go to uh, Yale and who'd been to Yale with the Bush and people like that. And I was coming back with a very heavy Dominican, New York Dominican accent, which was like a New Yorkian accent. So again, I had to learn how to adapt to this new uh, reality. Um, and then I left the Dominican Republic and I was 26 and went to New York. 
and from New York, I went to uh, Europe for about a year. I married someone from New Zealand there and moved to New Zealand for four years. Uh, in New Zealand is where really I become an artist, really. I had, I mean, I had an exhibition before that in, in Dominican Republic, but in New Zealand, I really take it up very seriously and um, do, did a lot of exhibitions in New Zealand. Oops. When Hold did on. you know you were an artist? When did you call yourself an artist? Or did someone call you an artist? Um, you know, as a child, I, I moved around a lot. And when I went to America as well, you know, so when I was a child, I used to draw all the time. That's all I did because I was coming to these new schools and I didn't know what was going on. So it, it was difficult. So when I got to the States, uh, age 10, I, you know, I was, I was a mess. And, but I was a very good draftsman. I, I could draw really well. In my fourth grade, you know, this is when I arrived, you know, my, the, my teacher said, oh my God, you're so good. And I had never, nobody had been aware of that. I was a good, that I could draw really well. That, you know, and, my, and I can remember when I think about how, my, how detailed these drawings were, they were really good. So I became the classroom artist. Age 10, I realized art was my thing. And I had some great teachers because the, the teachers, like when, like in fifth grade, which my English was still really limited, my teacher um, would let me do a lot of the things through art, you know, like, if, you know, to do a project, a, pro, uh, a report by doing, you know, like a, a 3D drawing of the Parthenon or something. I would decorate the walls and I would draw on the walls. And so I became the classroom artist. So from there on, my identity as an artist, it was the thing I had. And it was the thing that carried me, even when I went back to the Dominican Republic, again, this is one thing that I had that was very special with my art. And so that helped me to sort of really um, just, you know, navigate through things. And, and it was able to actually, you know, make my life a lot easier because I had this one thing that was special, that was art. And, um, you know, it just, you knew that, that you know, that this was important. Um, that's why I really value teaching. I taught for a while uh, children uh, in art and I did so, and I still believe that it's one of the best things you can do because for me, it changed my life, you know, and I think it has a power to change a lot of kids' art it, lives who have, problems you know in many ways either they can't speak because I, I not only could not you know I was changing um, languages but I was also a stutterer I had a lot of problems with even speaking in Spanish wow. so for me I was a visual person you know um, so uh, let me see this how is long were you in um, Dominican Republic when you went back in the United States before you went to New Zealand I was there nine years nine and I Okay. Yeah, and I couldn't go back. I couldn't leave because my father had to turn in our my American uh, residency. So I had to by myself at age 26 get myself another residency. I did it all on my own without a lawyer, and I managed wow. to get uh, my my green card again. Come back to the states, and when I was here uh, in New York, I then also got my sister her papers myself because. Um, you know, I realized that, you know, she was like a divorced girl and she, you know, with one child, she was not going to be able to do very well. Because Dominican Republic, when in this, in those days, if you were 25, you know, not married, you were old. And if you were divorced with the child, it was even more difficult. So I got my sister a, a visa and residence. And then all my family came back to the States. They all came and because there were two major hurricanes uh, that basically destroyed the Dominican Republic economy. And so my father who had, you know, had a pretty good life there and everything, had a business, his business went down and he had to come back to work in the States. Um, and they all moved to Miami. Um, I was living in New Zealand and I would come back and I didn't actually like Miami. I didn't want to come to Miami. And it was a very different Miami, it was 80, you know, in the early eighties. Um, and, uh, but for me, it made a lot of sense to come back to Miami to live here because Miami was close enough to the Dominican Republic. I didn't want to live in the Dominican Republic. I tried living there for a year and it just didn't work out for me. I, you know, when you immigrate, you immigrate for strong reasons. My reasons for immigrating was because 
I wasn't comfortable with the way women were, you know, were, were treated there. I wasn't comfortable with the whole class system. I thought you either exploited people or they exploit you. And I, you know, I didn't want to live in that sort of society. So I came, you know, that's why I left. And for me, you know, the whole, the whole social class, the whole, the way people treated, you know, the, the whole denial of our blackness and our relationship to Haiti, all of that was something that I also had to learn about. So because I, you know, I had not really gone to a lot of Dominican schools, I had to do a lot of research. So I went to the, when I was in, in FIU, um, I took, I, I borrowed money and I went to the Dominican Republic to do a lot of field research myself. And, um, and this is when I was able to learn a lot about the Dominican Republic because when I was in New Zealand, I started to decolonize. I started to learn about, you know, my own relationship, my family's relationship to our blackness, to Haiti. You know, why we're, why was there so much denial in Dominican Republic of, of blackness? Why, um, you know, what was it all coming from? And I had to go, go back and, and study and learn and do it firsthand because in, in actual fact, the Dominican Republic didn't have a lot of information. There weren't a lot of books, a lot of research done on Afro-Dominican culture. Uh, a lot of issues were not really talked about because in the 70s, uh, Trujillo had, um, you know, in, in, I mean, not the 70s, before the 70s uh, and before Trujillo was killed, um, all of this information had to go on the ground because anything that was perceived to be black, to be Haitian, if anything was black was Haitian, anything was Haitian was prohibited. If you were, if you, even the color of people, people were not black in the Dominican Republic. They were brown, light, 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 light Indian, dark Indian. Nobody was black. The only people that were black were the Haitians because if you were black, you were supposedly Haitian, you could be killed because it was a big massacre of Haitians. And so this whole relationship with African things was something that I, you know, was aware of, but I wasn't that aware of, you know, so I had to go learn about it and really uh, firsthand. And I did it with the help of some musicians who, like myself, were investigating Dominican, Afro-Dominican music. And so they were the ones that, because it was a very difficult thing, it, it wasn't something you could just easily go into the fields, you know. These, these places are very impoverished places. These are places where the sugarcane uh, industry has collapsed. The, the sugarcane mills have been closed and dismantled. These people have no jobs. And on top of that, in the 90s, uh, you know, it was, was it the 90s or 2009? I can't remember now. That, um, you know, they wanted to deport a lot of the people, the Haitians who were children of Haitian immigrants back to Haiti. And these people had no papers even though they were born in the Dominican Republic, they had no papers and they were never asked papers when they came. And so now they're, they're, they're like stuck in this situation where they, if they leave that area, they could easily be taken and sent back to Haiti where they don't have anybody. So it was a very difficult situation. And, um, but this is after, yeah, this is like in 2009, I think it was. Um, it was after the, the, the uh, earthquake, I believe. And, uh, you know, but I started my research in 97, 96, 97. I wanted to do it before, but I couldn't find ways of doing it. How do you know, how do you go in there? You know, when, you know, when I go in there, I, they presume I'm, I'm a foreigner uh, or they see me as a Dominican that's not like your normal Dominican. So she's foreign. Um, I go in there with, you know, with ex expensive equipment and by myself. And, um, a lot of my friends say to me, like, you know, who do we call if something happens to you? They're afraid because it is a very impoverished area. And I, they, you know, they see me as someone who has all these equipment. Dominican, some parts of the Dominican Republic can be very dangerous. And, you know, the police doesn't even go into those areas. So, but, you know, I go there. I'm known. They know me. They, you know, I think if you go in there with respect and love, and you, you know, you, you find how you do it uh, because all these things, you have to know how to do it properly without, you know, you don't go around displaying money. You don't go around giving money to everybody. It's not a, it's not a good idea and it's not done properly like that, you know? So you have to know how to do it. And for me, it's been a real <coughs> learning experience because it, I went in there really research of, you know, the culture, like the bra-ra or the gaga, which is called Dominican Republic but I ended up really finding out about the community 
and the people in the community, which, you know, to me was even more interesting and more important in a sense, you know, because, um, but you can see in, in a lot of my work, I, through this research, I've learned a lot of the values, a lot of the, the concepts that um, come from Afro, from the African religions. Excuse these me. These are beautiful. <laughs> what are, are these from um, exhibitions in Miami or where are these from? Uh, these are the these are like um, Miami. Uh, the the top one is in in the World Arts Building. Um, the second one was in um, in ninety in two thousand I think two thousand um, one or two in uh, uh, Locust Project. Mm -hmm. At the bottom left is in Dominican Republic during the Biennale there. The the other one the next one is in FIU. Okay. No, sorry, not FIU. FAU, uh, Florida, uh, the one in FAU, 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 and then the last one to the right is in the Dominican Republic again in the Biennale of the Santo Domingo. Um, and then we have uh, this, the top one here is in uh, PAC, which is the Pavilion of Arte Contemporanea in uh, Milan, Italy. These were from Milan. The very important exhibition called Art, Religion, and Politics curated by John Hubert Martin, who did a very important exhibition called um, The uh, Magicians of the Terre, the, the, the Magicians of the, of the World. And in this show, uh, it, I was very fortunate. I, it was also, uh, the, the other people were people like um, Joseph Boyce, Dan Flavin, very important names, you know, um, that he mixed with, with people from, from the peripheries, you know, like myself. Jose Bedia was in that show as well. Um, so where so, do you find your supplies? Are you are you looking online? Are you going to um, no? I, I, I markets I, or how do you find your um, some of your things look like they may be found? Are you making yes, them all? Yes, I I you know I most of my materials are found materials. Or I work with very sort of the kind of the things that people in, in the Dominican Republic or places like that work with, you know, like uh, a lot of plastic things, a lot of, you know, but most of it, I go, I go hunting for it. I, um, even when I show up like in Italy or in France or wherever else that I go, I usually have to go dump dumpster diving or looking at, you know, mostly the flea markets, dumpster, or I go to a lot of secondhand thrift shops. I'm like a regular on though, because if, and I have to, you know, stack it all up and save it because I kind of know my materials now. So I have to save them. So when I, like I get invited to something, I can easily put the, the things together. Um, and because, you know, you can't, you know, you can't just find them when you want them. You right. have to look for them and then save them. So when you need them, um, so it's like and and you know it's it's repurposed. Um, I believe a lot in that. I mean, when I first started to go into these fields, you know, I went. I remember going to this place called Mata Los Indio in '97, and it was a little village that had that they did this annual thing where they kind of exchange. I mean, they, they mimic uh, a lot of the Catholic things, you know, so they, these two villages exchange these kind of saints that they carry in their heads and things. And I said, I'm going to go there and I'm going to help them put it together. So I, I brought some materials. By the way, these are Sorry? these, I love these pho photographs. Yes, these are, these are 20 by 24 Polaroids that I was invited to do um, with a patron, uh, Jay Johnson Gallery. They hired the photographer the photographer costs 18 I think 18,000 or something a, a wow. day it's a crazy amount because it's a huge machine to take these photographs and it has to be like photographer and the assistant and I had to you know work as much as I could and understand you know what worked so I brought a whole lot of my stuff <laughs> and uh you know, did, did, did these like really series of amazing photographs. For me, I, I love them and they're so lush, you know, when you mm -hmm. see these um, Polaroids. Um, so, you know, I started to do performance uh, because, you know, I had uh, from nine, from 
2004 to 2000 or 2003 to 2008, I had a 25,000 square foot building in, in Winwood that was loaned to me. And this is where I started Edge Zones. And at the end, we had 23 spaces. And, you know, we would open them all up at the same time. I was wow. doing, I was doing an art fair, Zones Art Fair. And every month we'd open up these, you know, 13 or so exhibitions, you know. And you can imagine, we had no money. It was myself and my, my then partner who actually was part owner of the building. And we did a lot. I mean, I worked so hard. Um, and, you know, and it was really, it was really tough. Really, really difficult, a lot of work. I, I learned a lot. But for me, you know, I felt like we had to do something with this building. This is the beginning of before, like when, um, when our Basel started showing up here, we started doing projects that also took us to Art Basel, took uh, artists from Miami to Arco in Spain, took Miami artists to Puerto Rico, uh, Beijing Art Fair, different art fairs, you know. Because we wanted to understand the phenomenon of the art fair, you know, how do, where do we stand in this, so, you know, local artists, you know, so we started doing an exchange with um, the Ping Pong Project uh, with Basel artists and they would, we would give them a space in our, in our gallery and they would let us have spaces in, you know, parallel spaces during Basel, um, Switzerland. And all of this was a great eye op opener. We learned so much of you know what it was in fact i think i learned too much and to the point that i got so saturated that i couldn't see like when 2008 the building that i was in sold and then i got another space a smaller space on 25th street and and winwood and uh east of um in uh, north miami avenue i did three years of that and then i just became totally like saturated i couldn't really even see objects. I didn't want anything to do with sales. I didn't want anything to do, because I'm not an art dealer. I never set out to be an art dealer. I wanted to, I just felt like if, you know, if artists show their work, they want to sell. So I wanted to help. But in fact, you know, that's not what, what I set out to do. And I think it was very damaging for me. And uh, so I had to stop. And, and then I went into performance art. Uh, this is when I started in 2012, the Miami Performance festival and for me you know this is the, the way i learned things is through doing and through like working with communities i had been going to a lot of performance festivals in the dominican republic and bringing artists from miami to the dominican Republic to join this performance festival because since 97 i was i had already uh my own nonprofit. it wasn't college so it was called miami Art, arts collaborative but we were under the the um the auspice of the Rhythm Foundation. So, uh, you know, they were a fiscal agent and we were, you know, so I was participating and I saw how this, you know, in Dominican Republic, no money, they could actually have an international performance fest. I'm like, we could do this too. So I got very excited because I need to be excited to do work. And I got, you know, got very excited, you know, even though I was like saturated with the art and the, you know, paintings and objects, but, the performance got me excited. So I started to perform, to do the performance festival in Miami. This is in the Dominican Republic. Um, and, um, you know, and I got excited with that. This is, this is in Mexico City, as I was bringing artists to these places. Um, and, you know, learning, I was learning, I was meeting the community of performance artists. I, I think, you know, it's great when you switch, when you switch, um, mediums you, you you like it opens a whole new door to so many new like people that you could be interested in things and just the medium itself you know so it, i have to work excited that's so, what i find you, fascinating about your work is that you do so many mediums and when, just when i think you're doing performance or installations you start doing ceramics and then you're working on now you're working on something else right you're working right, on right yeah, it's so like I, I work on like, you know, seven year runs, you know, I, I think, you know, I have, I, as a child, I played a lot. I was I just played so much. It looks like you have fun in your work. I do. And I, as a child, I played a lot. And I don't know if you, if as it's children, you remember, but children go through these like fevers, you know, where like it's Jack 
playing, you know, jacks or playing with the top or, or playing, you know, ball, playing cutout dolls. You know, we, I grew up with a lot of cousins. And so we would go through these like fevers of like, oh, now everybody, you know, you, I mean, it was like, I remember playing cutout dolls and I would wake up before everybody else in the house woke up and before we had to go to school with my cousin so we could play, you know, before school. And, and I think that that's the way I still, you know, work. I, I operate like that. I still want to operate where I'm really excited about what I'm learning. And um, so I switch medium. If I get, you know, if I dry up in one medium and it's not exciting anymore, um, rather than, you know, stop, uh, get a block, I, I switch. And so for me, switching like performance, but then, you know, you get to a point that performance, you know, then I went from performance to noise and which I'm still really interested in the noise community and in, in, in sort of experimental sound. I really like that community. So that's something I'm still, I wish I could do more uh, sound. I realize I have my limitations and that to learn to properly do music, sound, even if you know, it's electronically, you have to have a lot more time that I have. I don't have that time right now. And I, so, but I'm leaving it there. I have all these instruments that I, maybe when I get a lot old and I can't move a lot, around a lot, I'll be doing that, you know? So I'm not totally giving up on noise myself. Um, so, uh, you know, I, and that's what I do. I switch and now, yeah, you'll see what I'm doing now, but this is, this is part of my research into the Dominican. Um, oh, I have a message from Pip. She's saying, join her with your instruments. She needs percussions. All right, great. Definitely. <laughs> and she yep. says she loves that you talk about childhood and playing in your artwork. Yes, I think play is so important. I think children, you know, I think everything I know in art, I kind of learn from playing, you know, I, and I think it's, it, it's, it's, you know, if you're excited and you want to learn something, you will. You know, I think le I think learning should start now, should be changed, you know? I think instead of the way, you know, people are just hammered over and over stuff, I think people should be taught with projects. Like, you know, you need, to, you, what project do you want to do? And what do you need as a child, whatever, or as an adult to do to, you know, what, what instruments, what, what, uh, what is it? what is it you need to learn in order to accomplish this? And when it's a need to learn basis, you learn, it sticks, you know, you practice it, you're doing it over and over again, rather than just getting all this information that most of the time, unless you use it, it's useless. It just goes right out of your head. There's such a waste. Yes, it's an exercise. It's an exercise and maybe memorizing and all these things. But I think if learning was more, you know, based on, on desire, on sort of these, you know, things that you need to learn, I think it would be, so much more useful and people would learn so much more people wouldn't turn out you know because i mean as a child i tuned out a lot you know and it was when i was excited that i learned and i i'm i'm, I'm mostly a self-taught person I, I taught myself most things that i that i know like in the arts i really before i graduated fiu and went to fiu i already had a career as an artist and and i'm still learning and i you know, basically learn most of the stuff myself, you know, because, and I think we all do, you know what I mean? But I think that if you, if you're excited, uh, you're more, you're more likely to, to learn and to, you know, get into different things. Um, like I, I learned a lot about how to construct, uh, you know, even installation when I went to these places and I saw how they transformed the room with like things like paper, somebody's bed cloth, somebody's, um, tablecloth and a little bit of glitter. They would transform this room and make it a sacred room with nothing. And I'm like, my God, it, you know, now I understand what installation is. And that's how I learned installation. And I, I'm still learning, you know, when I go to these places, I see so many wonderful things that people come up with, you know, like, look at this, you know, amazing, uh, look at their, their, their clothing and, wonderful. you know, and, 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 and it's all like done, you know, with very little money. Right. Um, I have a couple comments. I have one from Facebook, love the switching rather than getting blocked. And mm -hmm. then I have another message uh, from a comment from Pip. Um, Reggio Amelia curriculum, exactly that. So wonderful, totally agree with you. Thank you. Yes, so I got, you know, so one of the things that I got into performance, uh, I was, 
I realized there's a lot of different kinds of performance. You know, uh, the, the ones in the Dominican Republic were very kind of strictly, very performance, performance. And then, you know, I began to see how the rah-rah was actually a performance and, you know, in a very different kind of performance. So it tied more into my own work and as a group, because I'm a very group person. And I, and I love the idea that rara is a prayer and it's a prayer that requires a lot of bodies and a lot of people. And it's a seduction to the gods. So the clothing that is worn is worn in order to seduce the gods to sort of basically um, possess you and you become then the vehicle of the gods. And so, you know, I love this idea that it's not a spectacle. It is a basically an invitation. So when you see a rara, you're supposed to join. And, you know, you join part of, you're, you're part of the, what they call the, 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 the second line. And the second line is, you, you know, it's very, this is also very connected to the New Orleans uh, mm -hmm. second line and to the New Orleans the Black Indians. Um, because you have, I don't know if many people know, but a lot of the people that, the slaves that came to New Orleans came by Haiti, a lot of them, because when Haiti had the revolution, a lot of the landowners went with their slaves to New Orleans. And so a lot of that voodoo and a lot of that stuff actually comes from there, you know. And hence also the, the black Indians. Uh, in, in, in New Orleans, it becomes more about the indigenous because in Dominican Republic and Haiti, it is a combination of the indigenous, the African and the Catholic. Uh, but in, in America, you have a lot more indigenous people who are still alive, you know, therefore you get um, a lot more, of, you know, the actual clothing and all that, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and in New Orleans, it becomes incredible. The, the clothing just just is really, really amazing. A little bit because they have more money and also, you know, because it, it's a tradition. Like I was uh, interviewing some of the people who, who actually make the, 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 the clothing and they were telling me, and they're mostly men actually, they sit there all year and they, they do this incredible in New Orleans, work. right? You're talking Orleans, about, yes, yes. they, they yes. bead all year, right? Yeah. Right, yes. And, you know, they, they basically said, you know, they, 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 a lot of it also came from these like, you know, circus with the Indians came and they had this incredible clothing, you know, so therefore they, they copy that. They, they, you know, were influenced by that. So um, here is my newest um, thing, which is I, I started doing ceramic. I, I started, I was doing ceramic a long time ago uh, in the Dominican Republic when I went back in 88, when I left New York, I, I went there for a year and I picked up ceramic. Um, but it was mostly, I was doing a lot of things with molds and, and painting them, you know, glazing them, hand, you know, but hand and, and firing them. Um, but, but then I started to do it and I, and I had a lot of, you know, I saw my work really well. And all of a sudden I said, you know, I'm gonna start doing some ceramic. And, but this time I started doing a lot more hand building and a lot more, sorry, let me uh, get rid of this. Um, a lot of more hand building and um you know and just i'm really obsessed with it now and it's like it's like a love affair you know um unfortunately you know this is the thing with all these things is objects big objects require a lot of places to mm -hmm. store you know so if you don't sell them what are you going to do with them you know so i also i i'm also when i first started doing art like in back in the when i decided okay i'm going to be an artist you know I also love fashion because in the Dominican Republic, uh, I had to have all my clothing made because we didn't have a lot of um, clothing that were manufactured. So you had your clothing made. So I had this one seamstress that was a master. And she and I, you know, we, we were both very young and she, um, she taught, you know, I taught, she, I would sort of show her clothing that were well manufactured overseas. And I would say, you know, look at these details and, so she, and she was so smart. She would take that information and she would adapt and her clothing got so great that I would be stopped in New York and people would ask me where I get this, you know? So, but I didn't like making clothing. I don't like to sew actually myself. So I actually, um, I started to doing these necklaces that went like the one you see. And um, I came up with a new, uh, a new uh, project, which is called Caliban, um, voices and and um so an eku eku yambao which i'm going to be doing with uh, other people 
Um, and it's going to be a fashion. It's going to be about fashion and about, because I find that fashion is such a, you know, popular art that you, when you walk out in the streets and you wear things and people come up and talk to you. Anybody will come up and talk to you and say, to, and it's really amazing because I, all over the world, this has happened. And you, you, the people that you less expect, it'd be somebody with a suit and come up and say, oh, I love what you're wearing or, or you know, this or that. And it just, it's, it's like a, a something that you communicate so many things with in the streets, you know, without having to be in a, a gallery. So it takes it out from that whole system of, you know, galleries and, and brings it to the popular, to the people. And so I love fashion. And, um, and I think one can say so many things through, you know, through fashion, through it's, it's, it's very liberating. It's also very, uh, you know, you express who you are as a person, um, you know, with, um, with, uh, oh, how do I get out now? Um, there should be a red button if you want to stop yeah, sharing. There, there you go. Yes. Yeah. You go. So, you know, basically that's, uh, my new thing. And so I'm waiting for this to stop to see what I can do, uh, with the fashion and, um, so are you working with your seamstress? The same I'm working with a seamstress here and I'm working with seamstress in some people who were sold for me in the Dominican Republic because I usually go to Santo Domingo and I have things done there. So I have two or three people that I've been working with, collaborating for a while. So I just, you know, I, I mean, I, I can make some clothing, but I'm not good at it and I don't like it. I actually don't like actually constructing clothes because I like them well finished and I'm, I'm not the best, you know, I've never, you know, you masks during the pandemic at all or no? Sorry? Have you been making any masks or anything for the, uh, yes, I have some for myself, but again, I'm not a good, I'm not good at sewing. You know, you have to know your limitations. You can't know everything, you know, and sewing is just one of those things that I prefer to have, I, you know, because I've always worked with somebody. You have I a very distinct style, your style, everybody, I, whenever I see you, you're very, put together and stylish and yeah I would I thought you were making your own clothes but you're designing no, them and I'm having designing them and having that I what I do make is my necklaces but the clothing I don't make myself I I can you know I'm just I don't have the patience for it and you know it's a skill it's a it's a very good skill that you have to take a lot you know you have to be doing like I'll start sewing and then the machine breaks down or whatever and I get frustrated you know so, and, and you know, you have to really know how to cut really well. I mean, I, know, I, I, can, I can come up with stuff, but I'm not really good at it, not you know, right. so I, I have to, but you're, I leave it to those. So you're making ceramics. Do you have a kiln in your studio? I don't have a kiln. I'm deciding whether I should have a kiln or not. It's, you know, it's a big, because I don't, my studio is not particularly big and I have, I work a lot in the gallery in Edge Zones. So what I do is like times like now, like there's nothing happening. I will work in the back and I'll open up, you know, and then everything goes, gets, has to be clean and put away, you know? So having a big kiln would occupy a lot of space, would take up a lot of space. So I'm not really, um, I'm not really uh, working. I don't have a kiln. I work at somebody else's kiln. I take, I have to, I have to carry everything back and forth. It's a lot of work carrying it back and forth. And sometimes things get broken in the way, you know, but for now is my choice is to, um, because it, you know, that's a problem when you work a lot of different mediums is that you, you have to have a lot of different materials. Uh, and that takes up a lot of space. And if you don't have a huge studio, um, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's cumbersome and you have to, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you put everything away and then bring everything else back and, you know, back and forth with all the different kind of things. So it's the, one of the prices you have to pay with being right. sort of into these kind of, you know. How has the pandemic affected your practice? Um, well, you know, at the beginning, I was kind of just uh, watching and listening and I wasn't doing a lot. And, and I think we're all, I think we're all ba basically in this survival mode. And I think it's very difficult to be creative when you're in survival mode, you know? And also, you know, you have to like, for me, just looking around, you know, what, I mean, there were so many things that had to stop, you know, and when, when do we start again? How, how can we, you know, what's going to happen in the world? And so uh, a lot of my things were postponed. Like I was supposed to do something in Martinique that 
didn't happen. The Dominican Republic, it didn't happen. The shows here, my performances, a lot of stuff just has had to freeze. So I did go back into doing some of the my ceramic work. Um, I did a few, you know, pieces that are actually for the for the piece in Martinique, um, and uh, and I have been, you know, I'm doing things. It's also this is also the time. Uh, Springtime is also grant writing, and I'm the grant writer for my organization. So I've been very busy looking for money uh, for the organization because I, you know, I do things in blocks. You know, I, I when I have to work for the organization, I sort of just concentrate on that and and, and deal with that, and then I go into uh, other things. And you know, but I haven't really felt incredibly inspired. You know, it. This is such a weird moment you know where you basically just trying to figure out what next what what's what's going to happen mm -hmm. you know but i am preparing a lot of my uh new projects it's what i'm working on new projects and what you know like working at home mostly and and in the computer i'm thinking about maybe editing some books am i but i'm also thinking maybe i'll go back and do some painting and you know, do some paperwork or something in the gallery. It's very hot there in the summer though, you know, we have no AC. So yeah. I don't know, it's, it's, it's just uh, hard to know, you know, I, I don't know what I'm gonna do next really, except for, you know, the projects that I have. Actually, no, you know what, we are gonna, we're gonna go virtual. We, I started to work, try to work with the artists uh, for the performance festival and getting them to do virtual stuff. So, and and I have been going around interviewing people and things for projects, you know, so that kind of thing is what I'm busy on. But. When do you think that will happen? Probably next month. Okay. I think we're, oh. we're gonna start next mm -hmm. month. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we have to, you know, it's like, I feel like, you know what, We've, we're waiting and waiting, but one has to get active, you know? Um, I mean, I don't, <laughs> think that one can hide from this, you know, the virus forever. And I really believe in doing it, you know, going out, but carefully wearing your mask, you know, keeping social distance. But at the same time, I have to see what the world looks like. For me, if, I, if I'm stuck at home only, I couldn't deal with it. I have to go and see how people are reacting to it. You know, what, what's going on in the world? How are people, you know, dealing with this? Uh, pandemic are, are people you know wearing masks not wearing masks who's wearing it who's not wearing it why are they not wearing it um you know i go to the beach daily and i swim i've been doing lots of exercises which i think it helps you both mentally and physically um and, you know and but I, I don't see many people and and to me that's that's difficult because i am someone who's very uh you know um community even though, you know, here where I live in the beach, I have a lot of people around me. So I get to, I get to see the people um, that are in the, you know, in my neighbor and we talk to each other. And we, you know, we keep our distance, but we have a community here. And so between that and, and I go thrifting still, I do go thrifting I, with my mask and I still go in and sort of get my little, you know, seeing what's out there and, and collecting things. and. You know, it's still, that's another community. I, I feel very, you know, even though you don't see, you don't talk to people very close and all that, but you see them, you know, I think it's important to see people, see children. And when I go to the beach, I see children, I see, you know, families. I, that's to me is very important. I can't see, I can't see myself locked up forever because that's to me, that's not a life. Right. No, yeah. I understand. I think like we've been doing these Zoom, um, talk the live Emma's talks I love just seeing everyone because you know I see my colleagues here but we're all social distancing and and then I see my husband when I go home but it's nice when we do these and I can see everybody's okay and you know everybody looks good and so it does make me gives me some hope for our future so let we're gonna get through this so you know I think so I think we are you know I mean it's it's, you know, I'm a little troubled by the division, the divisive, you know, how, I mean, I think it's, it's hit, hit us in a very difficult moment, you know, which is just prior to the elections and to all these things that are going on. And, you know, it's, 
we are so divided right now and so fragile. You know, we're very vulnerable right now in a state like this to not be more together and not be, you know, not have a more cohesive, like, you know, communities, you know, because I think right now this would be so important in order for us to go forward, you know, forward uh, with what's, you know, healing. And um, it, the fact that this is, you know, the elections and, and this together is, I think, very bad for America. I think we're very, uh, we have to be very careful because this could be our, our undoing, you know what I mean? I think this is not, it's not new because during elections, you know, we've seen this before, but I think having the double whammy, you know, having the, the this virus and having all of this happening at once, uh, it, you the know. The economy, the virus, the- All of this race, is weakening. The race yeah. issues, the, uh, yeah. We have a trifecta. Yep. Yeah. And if God forbid something else were to hit us, yes. you know what I mean? We would be in a very vulnerable state. And I think we all have to think like that. We all have to think, you know what? This is not a moment to, to be together. It's a moment of healing. It's a moment that, that people have to, you know, stop the little petty things and, and do see the, the bigger picture. And do see that there are people that, you know, and I'm not saying that I'm against the protesters because I think, you know, just these kind of things, you know, unfortunately happen at the wrong moment, but there, you know, you can't, it just happens, you know what I mean? Uh, in a very difficult situation. But I do think that anything else that we can somehow try to heal and try to become one, um, it's a, would be a really good thing because I think that, you know, this, this is, makes us all very weak, makes this country very weak and very vulnerable. To, to anything that can happen, you know? And it, our enemies, and we have our enemies, they're, you know, they're winning they're in that sense. They're, they're, you know, I'm sure they're very happy to see us in the situation that we're in right now, you know? So hopefully we're all gonna put our share in it uh, to make, you know, to go back to being a, a country that- I love that hope. Yeah. I have a hope that we will get it together. We'll get out of this. I'm just, you know, we'll get through it, so. Yeah. Charles, it was so wonderful to have you on. Um, thank you for being a part of the Embus Live Art Talk. It's so great seeing you. We're out, unfortunately, we're out of time, but it was wonderful to hear about your practice. It's been great to catch up with you and see you. I think we saw each other last time at Dimensions Variable. That's right. In February, it seems like so long ago. An eternity. <laughs> So, but thank you again so much. I'm gonna um, take everyone off mute for a second. Everybody can say hi to you and um, give you some applause, a round of applause. Oh, I, I can't take them off mute. I don't understand. Oh, well. Yeah. Applause to you. Oh, there you are, Pip. Yes, I might talk. No. <laughs> <laughs> so. Thank you again. I'm such a big fan of Charles. Likewise. Very good. Very good. Like very good. Like it. Force in, um, in our community. So. Yeah. Thank you, Charles. You're fantastic as always. Thanks. So smart about really complex things. You kind of make them into very thoughtful and interesting. It's like your art. It's always providing new ways to think. I love that. Thank you. Thank you yes. so much. And Thank I was going to ask you how many, how many people were on the call in with Instagram and Facebook? Um, I just said, texted um, my team to let me out? know, and they're letting me know. Yeah, oh, they're, okay. Because we back have sometimes 80 or 90 people. Yeah, our, our Instagram and Facebook is usually more than our Zoom. Yeah, so Zoom is the smallest people. platform. Yeah, it's, it's really most intimate because we get to really ask you questions. <laughs> right. We right. see each other. So again, thank you so much, Charles, and thank you for everyone for coming tonight's talk. And then next week we'll have um, Gretchen Schnargel will be here with her uh, work on, on the environment and climate change. So everyone have a very good night and a good week. And please wear your mask if you go out. Thank you, Colette. Great job. Thank you. Bye, you guys. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.